The film is about Quo Vad, it's, it's called Quo Vadis Aida, and it details the 1995 Srebrenica massacre during the Bosnian War, when more than 8,000 Muslims were killed by the Bosnian Serb army. The film was written and directed by Jasmila Zabanic, I'm probably brutalizing her name, um, who was a teenager in Sarajevo during the siege by the Serb forces in the 1990s. And this film has earned enormous acclaim and an Academy Award nomination. The film centers around the fictional United Nations translator, Aida, who tries to keep her family safe as the Dutch UN crumbles under Serbian forces. As a translator, Aida has access to important inside information. Her family is among the thousands of citizens who are trying to find shelter in the UN camp, but things do not end there. Things are, she's finally able to get her family safe inside, but things do not end there. Knowing that her husband and her sons face certain death at the hands of the Serbian forces, if they have their way, Aida desperately does whatever she can to protect them. It's a very powerful, moving film. And um, I hope it wins the Academy Award. So I, I'm grateful to our guests from FGCU today. Um, unfortunately, Landon Fram was unable to join us due to a family emergency. Um, but we are thrilled to have Melissa Vanderberg, Associate Director head of archives and special collections, and also job number two, interim director, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Research. Welcome, Melissa. And Vanya Petrachevic, associate professor in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration. So before Vanya gives her presentation so that we all have a good understanding of what happened um, during the Bosnian genocide. I'd like Melissa to tell us a little bit about your center, Center for Holocaust and Genocide Research. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so happy to be with you all today. I wanna to thank Susan um, and her incredible team for all the work that they do all year round to bring us such programming that's educational, but also inspirational. It's really valuable to the community, so thank you. Um, as Susan said, I am Melissa Vanderbilt, and I am currently the interim director of FGCU Center for Holocaust and Genocide Research. Full disclosure, um, as she also mentioned, I am not a scholar of the Holocaust or genocide. In fact, I'm an archivist and a curator. Um, my relationship both with the Holocaust Museum and the center stem from my role and my full-time job as head of archives and special collections here. Some of, me, some of you may have heard of a show that we did last spring called The Liberation of Robinsbrook to Life. Um, I hope some of you had a chance to see it before COVID shut us all down. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about what my team and I are hoping to do during our term um, as interim um, for the Center of Holocaust and Genocide Research. My primary goals are really to strengthen relationships between the center and the community and to develop a more active role in our Southwest Florida partnerships. Um, so in, that of course includes the Naples um, Holocaust Museum and Cohen Educational Center, uh, the Better Futures Foundation, Shabbat Shalom, the Jewish Federation, ad infinitum. So if you are a part of or know of any additional partnerships that we should be reaching out to, um, please feel free to contact me. I will drop my contact information in the chat box for you. Um, we are also trying to broaden opportunities and perspectives for our students by creating partnerships um, abroad. So we're working with some um, institutions in Sweden and Norway and hope to expand that to be able to provide our students those unique perspectives and the opportunities of traveling abroad as well. Um, the name of the center changed, I think it was about two and a half years ago now. Um, and really the idea of changing the title was to highlight the mission of the center, which is research. The mission of the center is to increase the knowledge, I should have this memorized by now, but I don't. 
The mission of the center is to increase the knowledge and understanding of the Holocaust and genocide by providing education and research opportunities within the university and throughout Southwest Florida. To this end, we're creating resources that are openly available to our students, faculty, but also the community by providing access to scholars. So we've reached out to a lot of scholars throughout the university and asked if they do have expertise. Vanya, you're getting added um, in the Holocaust or genocide for them to be resources to the community as well as our students here. And we're also creating a long list of primary resources that we house here in the archive or things that we do have available in the library that are available to everybody. Um, so everyone here has access to this. We are your community. Um, really the goal is to set the new director up when they are hired to be successful. And it really is going to take the community to do so. So we want to hear what the community wants from a center of research. Um, so if you have insights, ideas, I really do want to hear from the community. It is my goal in the next year while I'm interim. And thank you again for giving me some time. Thank you, Melissa. We wish you all the success in creating these partnerships and we're happy to be partnering with you. So Vanya, is a scholar in this field and we are thrilled to have her to be able to shed some light on this very tragic and complicated history. And Vaughn is gonna share her screen. She has a presentation. So thank you very much, Susan and Melissa for your introductory remarks. And I'm very honored to be part of this um, lecture series. And um, I'm, I'm very pleased for the invitation, receiving the invitation to actually present about my country and to give a talk about Bosnia and Herzegovina. So thank you very much. So this talk uh, will be largely focused on the civil war in Bosnia and Herzegovina with a brief um, background information, keeping in mind that this region and specifically the country of Bosnia and Herzegovina have a very rich uh, um, history. And so it will be quite difficult to uh, give sort of an extensive overview in this rather short presentation, but I hope to provide you with some broader context related um, to the movie. So this is just a brief background of um, Yugoslavia as a country in order to fully understand the causes of its disintegration. So after centuries of occupation by the Ottoman Empire, which introduced Islam uh, to Bosnia, occupation by the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and an unsuccessful attempt at sustaining the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes in the long run, Yugoslavia was created in 1945 uh, with six republics and two autonomous provinces. Um, Vojvodina and Kosovo is presented on the map here. Josip Broz Tito becoming president, socialism being introduced, and eventually the country officially adopting the name of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. So there's oftentimes um, a misconception that Yugoslavia was part of the Soviet Union, which was not uh, the case. Instead, Yugoslavia was a communist country, but part of the non-aligned movement throughout the years of the Cold War. At the same time, Tito was a communist leader and nationalist movements were not tolerated. So Yugoslavia from the very beginning, uh, from the birth, uh, um, from its birth as an independent country was an artificial creation, uh, a mix of religions and dialects. And um, Tito managed to successfully suppress any nationalist sentiments that were um, present, although not politically visible throughout the communist era. So after, uh, after Tito's death in 1980 and essentially um, Toward the end of the 1980s, there was increased talk of independence in the Socialist Republic of Slovenia and Croatia. This is, of course, the time of the fall of communism throughout Eastern Europe and Yugoslavia certainly followed the trend of replacing socialism by holding elections and seeking out new and alternative methods of governance. But as opposed to other countries in the region, it opted for ethno-nationalism instead. 
So the starting point in Yugoslav disintegration is around the time of the first democratic elections that were held in 1990. And the nationalist leaders who have been suppressed in their political news for decades now um, had the opportunity to use socialism to gain power and they did not waste any time to do just that. So Yugoslav disintegration can be characterized by four wars. The 1991 war in Slovenia, the war in Croatia, the Bosnian civil war and the Kosovo war of the late 1990s. By the beginning of 1991, the question was not whether Croatia and Slovenia should be granted recognition. It was a matter of how and when. Tensions escalated to war, but armed struggle was short in Slovenia. Very few Serbs lived there and the 1991 war for independence fought between the Slovenes and the Yugoslav People's Army uh, lasted only 10 days. Croatia also declared its independence in summer of 1991 and was internationally recognized at the same time as Slovenia. However, the Yugoslav People's Army continued to fight over 30% of Croatia's territory traditionally inhabited by Serbs for centuries until 1995. In March of 1992, when it became clear that Bosnia and Herzegovina would also declare independence and leave the Yugoslav Federation, the Yugoslav People's Army engaged in its largest and bloodiest war in the Balkans since World War II. That war was followed by the um, Kosovo War that started in 1998 and only ended in 1999. Um, on this map, you will notice that Kosovo is part of Serbia. Um, but it gained independence almost 10 years later in 2008. So uh, Macedonia, Macedonia is the only former republic that experienced a fairly peaceful separation and declared independence in fall of 1991. So until the very last moment in 1992, Bosnians from all ethnic groups sort of cherished this illusion that there would be no war. So the question might be as to why Bosnia and Herzegovina had experienced the largest and deadliest war among the former republics of Yugoslavia. While there are many causes, one of its main causes is its ethnic composition as presented on this slide. As opposed to Slovenia and Croatia that were, that were and still are fairly ethnically homogenous, Bosnia and Herzegovina pre-war was a mix of primarily three ethnic groups, Serbs, Muslims, and Croats, that at the same time had opposite views as to what should happen to Bosnia and Herzegovina in the midst of Yugoslav disintegration. The Bosnian Serbs constituting approximately 31% of the population wished to remain part of Yugoslav Federation and to link large parts of Bosnia's territory with Serbia, while Bosnia Muslims constituting 43% of the population and Bosnian Croats making up 17% of the population were pushing for independence. So in March of 1992, Bosnia and Herzegovina held a referendum and declared its independence, which was recognized by the European community and the United States in 1992 backed by the Yugoslav army and the Slobodan Milosevic regime in Belgrade, Serbs declared the proclamation of independence unconstitutional and responded with armed resistance, which started, the siege, um, which, which started with the siege of Sarajevo, one of the longest sieges of a capital city in the history of modern warfare. It lasted for 1,425 days. So Sarajevo became the symbol of the war, despite the fact that atrocities were committed on all three ethnic sides in other parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina as well, including Srebrenica. Most of the international media was based in Sarajevo and mainly ignored other parts of the country throughout the duration of the war, where many gruesome acts of violence had happened to all three ethnic groups. So the stories about the Bosnian war were largely based on atrocities in and around Sarajevo, 
some of which were also misrepresented by international media outlets. According to the International Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia in recent studies on this topic, the war claimed over 100,000 lives. Out of these are over 36,000 civilians and over 68,000 military personnel. Hundreds of thousands more fled the country as refugees or became internally displaced. The war was characterized by creation of concentration camps and rape camps, mass graves, destruction of infrastructure, historic and religious sites, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. The images presented here are only the images, only some of the images um, that became international media's focal points. So two years after being designated a United Nations safe zone, in 1995, Srebrenica became the scene of the worst massacre in the Bosnian war, where over 8,000 Bosniak men and boys were executed by Serb forces. Genocide happened in Srebrenica, and the fact that more than 8,000 Bosniak men and boys were brutally murdered should never be denied. Given that the movie was primarily focused on Srebrenica, I want to provide you a bit more context um, to the acts of genocide that happened in that town. So the events leading up to the killings were a bit more complex um, than presented by media outlets and, and this movie. Aside from Serb forces gruesome acts of violence, we also have to acknowledge the failure of NATO, the United Nations, but also the involvement of the Bosnian Muslim Armed Forces. Given its geographic location as presented on the map here, um, Srebrenica is, is very much located on the border with Serbia. Um, and Srebrenica was a supply route um, for the Serb armed forces. And according to the classified British military documents, this supply route was under constant attack by the Bosnian Muslim forces in the months leading up to the genocide. Some view these events as self-defense while others view it as armed provocations. In addition, UN miserably miscalculated what it takes to establish a safe zone. The UN provided what they saw as protection, about 600 lightly armed Dutch infantry forces to oversee an increasingly mismanaged humanitarian situation. The Dutch commander called UN headquarters in Sarajevo and filed a request for UN support, UN air support after shells and rockets landed close to shelters and observation posts. But as we know today, that support never came in time to prevent the killings. So several missteps um, happening in the meantime, such as, for example, the request for air support being submitted on the wrong form and initially rejected, or even postponing airstrikes um, due to increased Bosnian Serb threats to begin targeting the Dutch peacekeepers. As Serb forces were advancing toward Srebrenica, about 15,000 Bosnian Muslim fighters had tried to escape from Srebrenica overnight. In the five days after Bosnian Serb forces overran Srebrenica, Europe was a witness to one of the worst massacres since World War II. And I just want to briefly provide you with um, the Srebrenica timeline uh, here. So in 1993, we see the creation of the UN safe zone. Um, an agreement was also signed um, shortly thereafter, establishing Srebrenica uh, as a safe zone, a total ceasefire in Srebrenica, demilitarization as presented here of the enclave, deployment of UMPROFOR, uh, and opening a corridor between Tuzla and Srebrenica for the evacuation of seriously wounded and ill. On July 6, 1995, um, Bosnian Serb forces begin shelling Srebrenica town and observation posts of Umprofor's Dutch battalion. Between the 9th and 10th um, of that same year, Bosnian Serbs uh, begin the takeover of Srebrenica. 
and to overcome a resistance from the army of the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina and the Dutch Bat. Bosnia and Serb forces intensify the shelling as villages in the Srebrenica enclave fall and the siege gets tighter. Bosnian Muslims stream into Srebrenica town seeking refuge. We all know that Srebrenica falls on July 11th, 1995. On July 12th, um, thousands of Bosnian Muslims flee Srebrenica to seek protection within the nearby UN compound to uh, which was located a few kilometers away from Srebrenica, Potocari, which um, where the movie uh, uh, was talking about. So it wasn't really directly in the Srebrenica downtown, but it was in Potocari. And by morning, um, there are about 30,000 Bosnian Muslims there. July 13, 1995, Shortly after the fall of Srebrenica, able-bodied men had set out on foot through the woods in the direction of Tuzla, which was a um, uh, Bosnian army held territory, and thousands of Bosnian Muslim men and boys from the Kalman civilians, but also members of the Bosnian um, Muslim armed forces are captured by Bosnian Serb forces and detained as well as brutally executed um, throughout um, the territory. Um, surrounding Srebrenica. And we can certainly talk about the movie uh, a little bit more because I think the movie portrayed as if all um, 8,000 Bosniak men and boys were killed in the compound, um, but that was not the case. They, they were captured also at other locations surrounding Srebrenica. And I, just to go um, a little bit back, Maybe I can come back to that later. So in 1995, um, the Dayton Peace Agreement put an end to the bloodshed in Bosnia and Herzegovina and imposed a rigid institutional restructuring of its territory, uh, dividing the country into two entities, the Federation where predominantly Bosnian Croats and Bosnian Muslims live, and the Republika Srpska, where predominantly Bosnian Serbs live. So the capital, um, uh, the capital city, the once border-free and ethnically diverse city, faced creation of the inter-entity boundary line that partitioned Sarajevo along ethnic lines, the Bosnia Croat entity in the west and the Bosnia Serb entity in the east. So on your right-hand side, I'm actually including personal photos that I took um, two or three years ago, sort of allowing you to visualize this boundary uh, between the West and the East within Sarajevo. So there are certainly no checkpoints. There are no fortified walls or barbed wire um, that sort of regulate uh, access in and out from one entity into another. But there are mental, mental boundaries that remind commuters on a daily basis that they are indeed entering another ethnic uh, um, uh, sort of the, ter the territory of another ethnic, ethnic group. So on the top um, right, you will see a sign once you're entering from the Serb Republic into the Federation. And you will notice that Sarajevo written in Cyrillic is crossed out. And Cyrillic script is widely utilized among Bosnian Serbs. Uh, um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And on the lower uh, right-hand side, you will see the sign sort of welcoming you to the Serb Republic once you are entering the Serb Republic from the Federation. So again, while there are no physical borders, the imposition of mental boundaries can certainly challenge pursuits of reconciliation among the three ethnic groups. So since we talked about Srebrenica, I want to briefly inform you about what has been done so far um, to address that particular act of genocide. And according to the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, um, so-called mechanism, uh, which is mandated to perform a number of functions previously carried out by the International Criminal Tribunal for um, Rwanda and the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, so the ICTY, there were first convictions for genocide in Europe since World War II. And by an international uh, criminal tribunal, 
uh, a creation that we actually did not see in Europe since the Nuremberg trials. In addition to 8,000 uh, men and boys executed, uh, up to 30,000 Bosnian Muslim women and children were forcibly removed from Srebrenica during the 1990s. Um, 20 individuals were tried, 15 convictions, one acquittal, one case terminated, and there are three ongoing proceedings as of July of last year. These criminal proceedings were also based on more than 1,000 witness testimonies. This again are just statistics um, related to the crimes committed in and around Srebrenica and not to uh, war crimes committed on, in other towns and villages um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So I will end my presentation with the following question um, and the following photos for you to assess whether there is any hope for a new generation of Bosnians um, to not perpetuate ethnic um, divisions, but instead engage in long-term peace building and inter-ethnic um, reconciliation. So this is a photo of a high school in the city, um, in the town of Tramnik, where there's almost no Serb population, but is mainly populated by Croats and Muslims. Uh, one half that teaches the Bosnian Croat version of history is completely renovated, while the other half representing the Bosnian Muslim students is old and crumbling. The schoolyard in front of the building is also divided by a wire fence, so they are not able to make contact um, even while in breaks from classes. And this type of an educational system, often called two schools under one roof, is a direct reflection of the country's post-war division. So the question is, what does the future really hold for a new generation of Bosnians and how to reconcile the memories of the bloodshed? Thank you very much. And I welcome your comments and questions. Thank you so much. That is quite a photo to end on, to see that division of the schoolyard. Um, that's incredible. So thank you for that very interesting presentation, which does raise a lot of questions. So there were 15 convictions. Um, do you feel that there was justice? Has justice been served? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, yes, we, we sort of uh, have established uh, uh, numerous means to, to sort of prosecute the perpetrators, but I don't, I don't think justice has been served by convicting only 20 individuals. Um, ad hoc tribunals have been created. We also have the International Criminal Tribunal in The Hague. Now we have this residual mechanism sort of supported by the UN, but a lot more needs to be done. A lot more needs to be done um, beyond just the justice system. I think healing within those survivors and, and psychological healing and overcoming trauma is as important uh, uh, as, as sort of having a list of convictions. Yes. And I've also heard that there's a lot of denial that this was a genocide or that these things happened. And I'm sure that that makes it very difficult to heal as well when your experience continues to be denied by the other government. Um, what can you tell us about these denial efforts? Uh, so the denial efforts are largely centered within Serbia and um, the, the sort of the Bosnian Serb entity of uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, very much uh, perpetuated by, by the politicians. Um, and, and denial also comes from the fact that there were, um, and I, I think maybe the confusion, not necessarily denial, but the confusion as to why this crime was seen as genocide among the Bosnian Serbs. Um, and this is from my extensive research uh, of, of former combatants and former um, and current veterans and former fighters on all three ethnic sides. Um, so 
they are arguing there, there were not only civilians, um, but also Bosnian fighters among the crowds and um, that it was uh, an act of aggression. Um, and, and so there's a sort of trying to justify and, and I don't know, you can't really justify. I mean, more than 8,000 uh, Bosniak men and, and boys were executed. So that, that, that constitutes genocide. They were separated and, and executed. So the denials, again, come from the politicians from the top down. Um, and I would say not so much from the bottom up. I mean, those who really experienced the war and were fully engaged in the war um, suffered enough that they fully understand uh, the gravity of, of the acts of violence that took place across the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, we have a question from the audience about what role did the Croatians play and what is their current relationship with the Muslims? So, yeah, that, that's a very good, that's a very good question. Um, because they were together and then they were separated um, during the Bosnian war. So, but essentially they fought together towards the very end of the war. Um, so they united uh, uh, against the Serbs in the end. Now keep in mind uh, during the very first days, if not months, uh, of the Yugoslav disintegration, the Croats and the Muslims did not see eye to eye as what should happen with Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, they wanted independence, but then they also wanted to pursue uh, um, other ideas as how that independence should look like, right? What, what independence means for Croats, what independence means for Muslims. But in, towards the end, and, and uh, um, they, they sort of united and, and um, because they, they, that was the only option uh, for them to, to fight the Serb forces, which at the very beginning of the war were very strong because they had the backing of the Yugoslav army. I mean, the Yugoslav People's Army was primarily Serbs, right? So, and it was backed by Serbia that had the munition and, and the, the kind of the military force to execute its uh, military strategy on the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, Yes, but yes, they were changing sort of positions and everybody was fighting against everybody on that territory, depending on the town. So it's quite complicated. And I think that what comes out or what came out here in the West is that you had this aggressor versus the victim. But I think depending on the location, uh, throughout the early 1990s in Bosnia and Herzegovina, that perpetrator victim kind of narrative changed, right? Because you had sort of the Muslims uh, um, sort of imprisoning, detaining, uh, and executing uh, um, Croats. Croats were executing Serbs, Serbs were executing Croats and Muslims. So it depended where you were located. And as I've stated, I think the stories that came out here to the West were stories primarily in and, you know, the atrocities committed um, in and around Sarajevo. And that certainly uh, um, gave us the idea that it's just the Serbs, right, that are committing these crimes. What also does not come out um, actually in the, in the scholarship, I mean, I'm having a difficult time having a balanced view about this conflict and finding, even if I want to assign this conflict to my students, how do I present it so that I present it with a balanced view? But what is oftentimes not mentioned is that both Croats, um, including Croatia being backed by Croatia and other Eastern European countries, the Muslims had the backing of the Mujahideens, right? Of, of, from the Middle East, Osama bin Laden and its affiliates who were fighting during the Bosnian civil war. And we, by we, I mean the West, we were supporting them at that time. And I think that it's, it's kind of a, a history repeats itself, right? Afghanistan during the 1980s. Um, so, but we, we do not get that picture out in the West, what was actually happening on the crowd on the Muslim side. We see this conflict as sort of a conflict between the Serb aggressors and the Bosnian Muslim and Croats as victims. And um, I think this narrative needs to be, that was certainly the case 
right? That that certainly happened. It happened in Sarajevo. The Serbs started it. There's no way to deny it. There's no way to deny that they brutally murdered and executed um, Bosniak men and boys in Srebrenica and in other towns of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But I think what we don't hear is what was happening to the Serbs, right, in other towns throughout the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the rape camps, the, the concentration camps uh, of the Muslims and the Kurds. So, and um, so, yes, so it is for me and for my students, it's oftentimes difficult to give them a text and just to tell them, go read this to get this background information and then come and we're going to discuss it. I usually tend to give them sort of the information and present all three sides, what was happening, the statistics, and tell them, go make up your own mind of, of, about this conflict, rather than sort of feeding them uh, um, information. Right. Um, very complicated situation. And, and the, the borders of these different countries or um, republics and seems that like that would also have had a, an impact on the what you're describing there with different groups acting in different times. Um, so clearly in the film we saw the failure of the UN and you also mentioned that there was a failure of NATO and um, we've seen with our programs on the Rwandan genocide, the failure of the UN. So have you seen any improvement in the decades since? Um, should we hope that the UN can intervene more successfully? Do they have that power? And what, what could they do? What should they do? Oh gosh, how much time do we have? And I'm actually teaching about <laughs> the UN uh, tomorrow in, in one of my classes. Um, we, well, improvement, we have, to, we have to define improvement and we have to define successful reforms and changes. Um, the UN has certainly improved in, in terms of, uh, specifically when it comes to peacekeeping. I mean, we, we're moving more and more towards robust peacekeeping use of force. Now, going back to, to my initial statement, what is improvement? Is that truly improvement uh, if we allow the UN peacekeepers to actually engage in a conflict? Um, although according to UN peacekeeping standards, you should be neutral, you should be sort of uh, trying to mediate. Um, they have certainly tried to improve the training of the individual UN peacekeepers, give them more information and, and both military training, but also country specific training, um, but, but, uh, but again, is that, is that enough to send these young men and women to the field uh, is the question, right? Um, and how much experience do they need to have before they're being deployed? There, um, I mean, all of these are questions that are still circling around, even after the Bosnian genocide, even after the Rwandan genocide. So again, improvement here and there, they have introduced new offices and new sort of bodies of the UN. They have, as I've mentioned, um, changed sort of the strategy of approaching peacekeeping from or with more robust means. Uh, than let's say 20, 25 years ago, where they were more or less bystanders um, and took a hands-off approach. Um, but again, there's much more that needs to be done um, in, in terms of both military training, but also country-specific training. Do these individuals truly know and truly understand the terrain that they are being sent to? Um, do they speak the language or can they know the basic phrases so that they can communicate and not necessarily rely on the translators uh, as we have seen with Aida in this movie? Um, do they have the basic knowledge of survival in a country such as, well, back then it was Bosnia and Herzegovina, but now more so the countries of the African continent and countries in the Middle East. So, um, it's context dependent when it comes to improvement success. 
-hmm. when it comes to the United Nations, but there's so much more that needs to be done, so much more. Um, and also the process of authorizing the use of force, meaning NATO has to be changed because that essentially comes from the UN Security Council. And now who is sitting in the UN Security Council who can actually veto uh, um, sort of authorizing these strikes or the powerful ones, right? So um, who has a say, right? Whether airstrikes are being authorized or not, whether UN peacekeepers are being sent or not, how much funding are they getting, how much training, how much knowledge do they have? All of this comes down to the UN infrastructure that certainly has changed, but again, we have to define improvement and success. So this is clearly, this particular genocide and conflict is a very complicated one, but all genocides are just um, an emotional, difficult subject. So you're teaching about this to college age students. Mm -hmm. And we have Sam with us today from the museum who teaches about this to middle school and high school age students. So, um, you know, what, how, what would you say the goal is, the end goal of the lessons? I mean, clearly we want the students to be the upstanders, that's a term that we use at the museum, to not be a bystander, to be an upstander, to understand some of these stories and realize that, that it's not just statistics, that these atrocities are happening to real people, just like you and me. Um, but they're our future. What, how can they shape the future? What do you teach them of, about um, how do you come to understand this and, and what can they do in the future? And maybe we want to give Sam, give your voice a little break here, Vanya. Sam, you want sure. to chime in for a moment? Well, time too, yeah. <clears throat> um, well, our goal is for students to, of course, just whether it's the Holocaust or any genocides is to have a kind of a gentle entry into the subject matter. We don't want to overwhelm them. Um, but the grades that we deal with primarily the eighth grade and then into high school grades, they're certainly either have the maturity to handle the information or at least starting to gain that maturity level. So we do it uh, a gentle entry into that information, but then we do discuss specifics. And we try to draw parallels from what they've seen, whether it's the Holocaust or Cambodia or something else that took place, especially the students a long time ago, um, to what's happening to today. And so we bring up areas, uh, China, North Korea, Central Africa, African Republic, Myanmar, which are happening as we speak. So that kind of, I think, opens their eyes to kids that this is it, it is something, it's tragic. It's something that took place a long time ago, but it's also happening right now while they're alive. Um, and then we do use the individual stories. And because we can't, we can't broadcast these massive numbers of 6 million and 5 million and, the, and the, the hundred thousands, those are too big for them to understand. We show them that it's relevant. It's occurring today in their lives and that there are individuals who are just like them, little boys and little girls, grandmas and grandpas. And those are the stories, those individual stories, just like our survivor stories that students can connect to. So they, it really becomes a human story, a tragic human story. And um, I think they can leave with that, that information um, with in, also in their back pocket, this idea of Stanton's 10 stages of genocide, so they can look around their world now and they can identify areas that they think may um, have something brewing, like a potential genocide or mass, uh, mass human rights violations of some sort. I don't, I don't sugarcoat anything. <laughs> so as maybe opposed to what Sam has stated, um, I, I actually, no gentle introduction uh, once you sign up for one of my courses, Be Politics of Extremism or International Armed Conflicts, I tell them up front, you will be exposed to images, uh, audio, um, 
and even documentaries on, uh, uh, you know, with the gruesome acts of violence. And you have to see it to fully understand the gravity of those acts of violence. And I think that might be also a little bit different um, at the college level uh, uh, than on a high school level uh, where they're a little bit younger. Um, so they, they are actually exposed to the stories of survivors, interviews with the survivors, interviews with um, UN commanders who were um, in charge, be it Rwanda or Bosnia or other uh, genocides. Um, so they hear their stories. They, they, they can sort of um, see, again, the brutality in their voices, right, in, in their demeanor. Uh, rather than reading something about the Rwandan genocide or the Bosnian genocide. And um, one specific example I can give you is in my introduction to comparative politics, where I assigned the ghost of Rwanda, which is about the Rwandan genocide. And I know that in high school, they watch the movie, and maybe Sam can talk about this a little bit more than I can, because uh, students come up to me and say that they watch Hotel Rwanda, um, and they come in uh, this idea, oh, wow, this is again another movie. I know all about this. Um, but I think that the acts of violence in Hotel Rwanda um, have been sort of minimized and indirectly shown as opposed to Ghosts of Rwanda, which is a documentary again um, with real raw images of acts of violence um, with again, interviews with the UN commander who was in charge at that point in time, Romeo Delair and the struggles he had to cope with uh, and the difficulties he had to cope with in the aftermath of, of that genocide. And I assigned them um, a reflection paper, to reflect upon it. Now you've seen it, now reflect upon it. And they also draw comparisons between those two movies saying that now while they understand the background information, both of those movies present the background information that the ghosts of Rwanda really, uh, um, made them uncomfortable in a way to fully understand the gravity of those crimes. So, yes. uh, and sometimes students have to get uncomfortable to, to fully grasp uh, that violence, human rights violations, acts of violence, gruesome acts of violence are actually taking place around the world. Um, and that sometimes they have to get a little bit uncomfortable to fully understand uh, the gravity of those crimes. Mm -hmm. I think as adults, we also have to get uncomfortable <laughs> to watch that. And, and there is a difference with age appropriate yes. lessons, um, but you're dealing with college students, fully adults. So um, I just, since you mentioned General Romeo Dallaire, I, I need to also mention that um, the museum is bringing him to Naples in March for oh, our wow. special Triumph Award dinner. So, oh um, my gosh. Well, we're very excited to be able to hear from him. He was a UN general in Rwanda who did stand up against his superiors and said, no, we are not retreating. We will intervene and we will help. Um, so I hope you can come to that too, Vanya. Oh, I would absolutely love to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. I mean, I teach about him and, and I sign readings I talk about him and I've um, assigned also documentaries uh, where he was the primary sort of um, subject uh, and, and his life and the struggles. So it would be absolutely amazing. So thank you. Yeah. Um, we have several more questions. We'll see what we can get to here. Um, but what about peace, reconciliation? Um, it seems like is, is the region still basically at a standstill in terms of peace building. What is, what is the government doing besides having a school under one roof that with a, <laughs> a fence between it? <laughs> so um, in short, not enough uh, to bring uh, these ethnic groups, um, which is so unfortunate because we, we are talking now about a new generation of Bosnians. And um, I think they're still continuing to instill ethnic divisions. Um, and I think, it, again, it is the top-down uh, structure that needs to be sort of changed. It is the politicians. There's certainly initiatives. I'm not, I'm not trying to generalize here. There's certainly initiatives at the local level um, 
sort of organizations, charity organizations, civil society organizations that are trying to push for reconciliation um, at the very local level. But I think a lot more needs to be done to, to really bring these different ethnic groups uh, um, to the same table, to have a to have the same vision of reconciliation. And I don't know, we, we are sort of running out of time, but I'm actually writing a paper uh, on reconciliation and I'm looking through media um, sort of headlines in, in these local newspapers of how they talk about reconciliation and the narratives of reconciliation. And we have three versions of reconciliation. We have retributive justice or emphasis on retributive justice, sort of per perpetrators need to be caught, they need to be prosecuted. Um, then we have non-retributive approaches um, to sort of uh, reconciliation, which talk about seeking truth, uh, forgiveness. And then we have the third version uh, which encompasses everything, including sort of a, a territorial modifications in order for reconciliation to fully take place on the territory of Bosnia Herzegovina. So this is a, a work in progress, um, but those are the three sort of um, approaches to reconciliation as, uh, and I'm sure all of us can guess that these three approaches are coming from all of these three ethnic groups. So Serbs have a different version of reconciliation uh, um, than Muslims and, and Croats. Mm -hmm. It's a long road. Yes, definitely. Um, I'm just looking at a few um, comments, uh, comments such as um, you f when you watch the movie, you, you do feel like you're in Aida's shoes as a mother. And um, you know, can you pick one of your two sons to survive? That that Sophie's choice that's, that was just heartbreaking. And um, you know, terrible. Um, I think that that is about all the time we have for the questions. And thank you so much, Vanya. Um, and Melissa, thank you for telling us about the center. We look forward to partnering with both of you more in the future. Um, I did want to, again, thank our sponsors uh, in the Movies That Matter and the Human Rights Film Coalition. We have Jen Showa of Southwest Florida, Temple Shalom, the Jewish Federation of Greater Naples, the JCRC, and the Naples United Church of Christ. And we also have generous sponsors for our films and we're very grateful for all of that support. Um, so I hope you will also all join us next week, same time, same bat channel, <laughs> uh, for food chains. And we will have with us two farm workers from Immokalee and their translator from the Immokalee Coalition of Workers um, talking about the challenges that they face as farm workers and trying to earn a living wage and trying to work with um, the supermarkets to increase the price of tomatoes and, and other, other places. And, and these folks have been very successful in, in certain ways, but there's also a long way to go. So that will be next week. Um, thank you to everyone. And this will be, uh, recorded and available on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. <laughs>